and welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we talk about basically k-means and many variants of it, basically also how to derive it and the math behind it, which uh, shows us some more general principles. So um, we've seen lots of different topics, um, in particular recently two examples of unsupervised learning, um, which I will detail on the next slides further this idea of unsupervised learning. Um, these methods were all nonlinear dimensionality reduction or linear dimensionality reduction. So basically we were trying to invent like a, a subspace to describe our complicated data set. Today we will look at clustering methods where we kind of cluster the space into different parts. Okay, and this is corresponding to a classification um, problem where we invent labels for our data. So, and we do this all with probabilities. So let's go get back to probabilities as well. Okay, somehow they are always there, the probabilities, but not prominent on the slides sometimes, but it's always good to think about them. So first of all, so what is unsupervised learning? In unsupervised learning, we only have inputs, or with other words, we have this data set x1 to xn. So we only have a point cloud in space. And the, the single points, they don't have a label like being class one or class two or class three. However, if you have a certain point cloud, um, suppose this is your point cloud, right? Then a very good first description would be to say, okay, so what does it mean here? Okay, so that is kind of giving us the location of the data, okay? Then there's a second description, which is about the spread. So how is it spread out? And maybe we get an ellipse like this, and this is the covariance matrix, basically, of the data. And by having the mean and the covariance, we're having like a description, we have fitted the Gaussian distribution to our data, okay? However, um, so this could be used for the covariance matrix It's also telling us something about some local axis. Here, maybe one is longer than the other, if there are enough data points. Um, and somehow it's so it's also giving us a linear embedding. However, often data look like this. So there's one cluster and there's another cluster and there might be even a third cluster. And now if I would fit a Gaussian distribution here, what will happen is that this thing will be the mean, okay? And I will get a gigantic covariance where I would say, okay, now I could sample from this mean and from this covariance, but then the sample data will look very different than these three clusters that I had. So maybe it's a better idea first to split the data into these three clusters, so to apply a clustering method, to split it into simpler parts, and then on each of the parts you then fit a Gaussian or something. And that's exactly what we are going to do today. However, the overall goal is to find a good description of your data, okay? So that is basically the thing that we actually want. We want to find a description of our data. And the description could be like the principal axis, but it could be also different clusters or combination of both, okay? So probabilistically speaking, we could also say what we want. We want to find a probability density function of our data. So this is now a more general point of view. And in a way, by estimating the mean and the covariance matrix, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We are fitting a Gaussian distribution. We are, we are estimating the parameters of a Gaussian distribution when we're doing PCA. Yeah? And no matter whether the data is really from a Gaussian distribution, if you apply PCA to your data, you are fitting a Gaussian, okay? So that's a probabilistic point of view to it. However, we could think of more complicated models. So in general now, we looked at the, a situation where we were looking for a low dimensional embedding, for example. So that was the dimensionality reduction thing. And we could also view it like inventing this data set Z1 to Zn. And probabilistically speaking, we could also say we are inventing a, a simpler, simple looking distribution P of Z. And then we would say P of X given Z has a certain distribution. Okay. So by saying, so now there's the true underlying manifold which might be a two-dimensional Gaussian or something. And then the F is a transformation that puts it into high dimensional space or even on a curved manifold or something. Okay, so it can be probabilistically written like this. And of course, 
they are zillions of variants and they are not always a probabilistic interpretation, right? When you think about the LLE method, about the isomet method, we didn't talk about probabilities here, okay? However, nonetheless, when you see the local linear embedding method, for example, it's like fitting locally Gaussians, right? So you're kind of fitting, you're estimating a local covariance matrix that is like only for your neighbors. And by this kind of, you're also having like a mixture of lots of Gaussians along the manifolds that you're fitting. So in a way, you can add these probabilistic twist to the whole thing, also to algorithms where you don't see it, obviously. Okay, the other option is, so one is having like a continuous space here, but we could also find class variables, okay, Z1 to Zn, which are now coming from a discrete set. And in this case, this thing is called clustering, okay, or we are fitting a mixture model. Yeah, so probabilistically, we can write it like this, that for example, the P of Z is now a discrete variable that is distributed according to a Dirichlet distribution, okay or any other discrete distribution, it doesn't matter, right? So just some distribution over the a finite set of integers, okay? And then given such a class label, such an artificial class label, I could have a simple distribution like a Gaussian, where now the mean and the covariance depends on my class assignment, okay? And this is also called a Gaussian mixture model. So for every class, we're having a different Gaussian. However, initially, we only have the point cloud. And the point cloud might be having different clusters and we have to find out what are the clusters and then for each of the clusters we could fit a Gaussian distribution to it, okay? Actually here are also many variants of this, many algorithms that come by by not looking probabilistic at all, but like I have the standpoint that in principle you can think of every method probabilistically, even if the original authors didn't, right? So that's always another way to describe what's going on, to talk about these dis different distributions. However, however, sometimes it might be very inconvenient to come up with distributions. Like in um, kernel PCA, yeah, it is quite complicated to come go from the, the, the uh, kernel function now, what distributions are we using? What is exactly the probabilistic model we are using when we're doing kernel PCA with a polynomial kernel. So that's not, an, that's not an easy question, but I think it, in principle it could be um, answered. So a more general point of view is where we ignore like whether we have a continuous space of latent variables or of a discrete space of latent variables to talk about latent variable modeling. So we have a point cloud and we invent latent variables here which are unknowns, okay? And we have one for each of the data points and those are kind of succinct dis description. So those could be cluster assignments or low dimensional embeddings or both at the same time, okay? And in a way, so this latent variable is kind of capturing kind of the, the relevant information that would allow us then to generate again a data point, okay? And again, very generally, we could talk about the latent variable distribution and then the conditional distribution conditioned on the information about a data point generates a data point. And this could be also seen like a graphical model where we have like Z and then an arrow to X, okay? That's how we model our data. Often now we have a weird notation again, like we have a little X instead of a capital X, so always be careful that you know what you're talking about, whether those are values or really random variables, okay? Question, what's the benefit of having this probabilistic view? Yes, so it depends on the method. So for some methods, really, it doesn't matter. But suppose you use this k-means method, as we will see today. Once you start to having a probabilistic view on it, you will see that the k-means method is a special case of Gaussian mixture fitting, or Gaussian mixture model fitting. And then you see that you could easily um, extend the algorithm that you have already yeah, to much more complicated stuff. So the probabilistic view is giving us kind of more information into the inner workings of a method, why it works. Possibly the probabilistic view gives us also um, some information about the hidden assumptions that we didn't spell out. And we just wrote down an algorithm because it's convenient and nice and it works very well, but maybe we don't know what the hidden assumptions are. For example, um, if I fitted a Gaussian, uh, if I do, if I run PCA on this data set with three clusters, right? I can do it, right? In super high dimension, it's very hard to see whether you have several clusters or not. 
for this you really would have to look at the distance matrix and um, but you can run pca but um if you get a deeper understanding of pca and you know so pca is basically fitting a gaussian distribution to your data then you now could ask the question so in this situation does pca really make sense or shouldn't you first do something else so some of the hidden assumption of pca is that your data is gaussian distributed okay or if you apply it nonetheless it's like putting your Gaussian glasses on and then through the view of PCA, everything looks Gaussian because you only are talking about the mean and the covariance matrix. So this gives you like an additional um, perspective whether your method is applicable or not, okay? And it might also give, give you a hint, okay, so fitting a Gaussian is, is fine, but maybe there are other models in probability theory that are more flexible like a banana Gaussian or something that might be more useful to real data, okay? So um, now if we have this general point of view, of course we can ask other general procedures how to fit these latent variable models. And I give you a hint. So somehow given only the data set, we, we need to come up with this additional information, okay? And so once we have this additional information, suppose we have X and Z, we kind of completed our data set and we can try to fit like the parameters of the joint distribution of X and Z, okay? And then when we have these parameters, then again, we could update our latent variables. And once again, we have updated them, then again, we could update the parameters of our joint distribution. So we alternatively, uh, we alternatingly estimate the latent variables and the parameters of a model, okay? And that's exactly the EM procedure, that's exactly k-means. They are all instances of this more general point of view. Okay, here's another question. Um, uh, is it a good habit to generate a distance matrix on new data that one is working on in order to see if there are clusters? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, this is like a, like a data scientist questions, right? So suppose you're working in a company, you get a really high dimensional data set. Now, what are you doing? So in a way, you're not really learning it in this lecture. So in this lecture, you more get the technical background and the mathematical theory behind it. But then practically what you should do is, of course, you should always try to visualize your data, look at 2D scatter plots of your data, whether you see clusters, um, try to apply clustering methods. And then once you think you found clusters, you can sort the data by the clusters and look at the distance matrix, whether you see like blocks along the diagonal, for example. So those could be hints that there are really some clusters, right? You know, methods like k-means, as we will see in a second, they always find k clusters. Even if there are only two clusters, they will find three or five clusters. And so it's important then to check what you what these methods are um, getting. So it's always good to see to get a different view. As I said, 2D scatter plots are great. 3D scatter plots are great. Running PCA on it is great. So this gives you like the most important directions and visualizing it. So visualization is super important to do this, okay? Actually, there's some interesting data sets that are designed in such a way that they are really complicated, but then when you look at them, you immediately see what's going on, okay? So there's also a gorilla effect. I think there's even a gorilla data set where when you look at it, you see what's wrong with the data and you can immediately solve it. And if you don't look at it and you just apply an SVM for classification something, you might completely fail just by running it like um, without looking at the data. So definitely you should do this. Good. Um, okay, so last time we looked at PCA, isomap and all these methods. Today we look at discrete unsupervised learning methods. We will look at clustering methods basically. And we focus on one clustering method, the k-means. And then having a general point of view on mixture models and more general on latent variable modeling. Okay, so that's what we are talking about today. There are many different clustering methods, which I'm not even talking about, but I think once you understand one of them, I'm sure you can use the others too, at least as a black box. But of course, there are always some, some algorithms behind that are also fun to understand. So let's talk about the EM algorithm. And there's a nice um, script from Mike Jordan. So this is not the basketball player, but this is Michael Jordan, the Berkeley professor for statistics and machine learning. So I think he, he might be even a more important superstar than the basketball player. Um, and he wrote a nice introduction to graphical model. I'm not sure whether it's, it came out of a book or whether there are only PDF versions around. In this kind of book, which I've never seen published, 
um, there's a nice description of the EM algorithm, which really, where you really say, aha, oh, okay, now I get it, okay? And then there's, of course, Chris Bishop's book on pattern recognition and machine learning from 2007, which is also a very good introduction to the topic. And I'm following mostly the Chris Bishop book. And then for the later part, for the generalized point of view, I'm following Mike Jordan's um, description. Okay, the intuitive motivation, and I think I copied it from the Bishop book, so I should, should check. So suppose you are trying to cure some, some ill people and there are different strategies. The obvious one, of course, for a doctor would be you first find out some symptoms and then you say, okay, this patient needs this medication and then there's another patient with different symptoms and the person needs another medication. That's plan two, okay? So you invent some syndromes. It's like clustering your data and then you split the, the people in these different clusters and give them different curements. And plan one is the non-obvious one that you have a single super complicated procedure that is for everyone. Yeah, you just take all drugs, you put them together and make a big cocktail and that will feed everyone and make everybody healthy. So that is the complicated way where you have a single procedure, okay, for everyone. And the other one is to split it into examples. And the same could be said if you do statistical modeling. You have a complicated data set like the one on the board and you could try to find a single super complicated model that fits all your data, or you first invent classes, yeah, and then you have a, a simpler model for each of the classes, okay? That's, when you see this comparison, it's like the super obvious way to do it. So you shouldn't come up with a complicated way that fits your data. However, as obvious as it looks, right? I mean, in the times of deep learning, we are often following plan one, right? We just take the data set, it's super high dimensional, we have lots of data points, and then we just say, okay, let's run a super complicated neural network with 10 hidden layer and ResNet architecture and whatever you name it, batch normalization, all the cool stuff, super complicated neural network, and you get it to work and you will train it and it will fit your data somehow, okay? So also neural networks could be used for this task. Um, at the end, you might have fitted your data, but you haven't learned much about your data. So you kind of get a black box, but you don't really get an understanding of what's going on in your data set. Instead, um, these, having these different classes is super useful. Yeah, here's another example from physics. Let's say you're an astronomer and you um, uh, measure the light curves of some stars or something, or maybe the spectrum of the, the different lights of stars. And then you could fit a comp super complicated model and then you say, now I understand the world. Now I have a statistical model of all these different light curves. So that might be one option. The other option is first to define different classes. So it looks like there are different types of stars. There are older stars and younger stars. They are in different stages. They, they might have different sizes, which lead to different physical properties. And it's first to get these different classes and then you try to describe each class separately, okay? By the way, then you can also write a paper on each class separately, which is also nice, right? And you can invent lots of different names. So probabilistically, this is now implemented, this idea by having a so-called mixture model, okay? So basically, think of the F sub i, like Gaussian distributions, for example, and then for each mixture component, each of these k components, we have a different set of parameters, theta sub i, so we might have different means and different covariance matrices. Um, these mixture components, each of them uh, can be viewed like a PDF. So the F sub i are each a density, okay? So they, if you integrate over the x, they will sum up to one. So if you add lots of them, kind of you need to use a convex combination, okay? So you take a combination where you give each of the components a weight. In this case, they are called pi sub i. Yeah, they must be greater than zero and the summation must be one, okay? So basically a linear, com a weighted average of all of those. And um, then let's let's draw it on the board. What's, how does it work? So suppose um, we are now talking about 1D space. So I'm having just this one dimensional space and here I'm having one mixture, okay? So it has a certain mean and it might have a certain um, standard deviation here, okay? So that is mean one and sigma one. And uh, here's another one, okay? So it also has another mean and a certain standard deviation, mean two and sigma two. 
And now I could add them up, right? I could take the summation of both. And for this, I have different options. So I could, for example, give them the same weight. Then I will get this curve, okay? In this case, maybe the pi one is equal to a half and the pi two is equal to a half. Okay, I'm just summing up those two things here. However, I could also change these weights and I could say, okay, one of them gets four fifths and the other one gets one fifth. So they're also summing up to one. So what will happen to the plot here? Basically this bump will go up and the other one goes down. Okay, so let's draw it. So basically now I will have a mixture which looks like this. Okay, so I having most of my data is coming from here and one fifth of my data is coming from there. Okay, and so this is now a mixture distribution. And as you can see, it is a much more complicated shape here than just the usual Gaussian distribution. A single Gaussian distribution just has one mode. It only has one maximum, okay? But now we could have several of those, okay? And of course, I can do the same thing now in 2D where I, where I would draw it now like this. So I would have a mu1 over here, maybe a mu2, possibly even I have a mu3 here, and maybe I have a, a mu4. Each of them possibly have like a, like a unity um, thing. I could draw a circle. So this now means that the sigma one is the identity matrix. Sigma two is the identity matrix. And sigma three and sigma four, they are all identity matrix, okay? And now you could imagine now if I sum it up, I get a nice, nice landscape where I'm having like these four hills, right? And those two hills might be almost merged. So you could go uphill here, up to here, then you go a little bit down and then you go up again to the other one. However, now I could also change now my, my weighting. So I could say that um, my pi one is equal to whatever, let's take six tenths. And this one gets two tenths and the pi three gets one tenth, pi four gets one tenth. Okay, and that now would mean that these circles, I might draw them now smaller, okay? So here I would now draw small circles. This one is slightly larger. And this one will be very big. And now if you sum them all up, you will see that there's a very big hill right here. And then when you go downhill, maybe here you will have a little hill in the other hill inside. Then you go down and here's another hill, here's another hill, okay? I think you get the idea. However, of course, now I could also change this guy over here and I could give it whatever, uh, something like 10, one is the covariance matrix. What, how would the image change? The image would change that now in one coordinate kind of, I'm very large and in the other coordinate, I'm very small, right? And similarly, I, in principle, I could have like arbitrary matrices here. So uh, it was three. So basically I could also have arbitrary orientation and ellipse and you could sum them up, okay? And those are now all examples for like mixture models. And of course you can also do it in higher dimensions. Good, so that is basically a description of what's going on here, okay? So, Let's introduce some notation, okay? Let's, how, what, now, what exactly, how are we using the ZI? So there are different possibilities. So typically this latent variable now ranges from one to K, right? So that's a cluster assignment. Um, however, sometimes it's also useful to say the Z is like one hot encoded, right? So, and the one hot encoding basically means that it's a K dimensional vector with binary coordinates where only one of them is one and everyone else is zero, okay? So if Z is equal to I, then we could write the components Z, the I's components then will be one and all other components will be zero, okay? The only confusing thing is that I'm using the exponent here, but this is because I'm following the, um, the, the, the book of um, uh, Chris Bishop here for the notation. I think there's a question, so do you have a question? Ah, okay. 
So let's flip back. So here are no Zs, right? So here we only had these parameters. The theta was basically containing, for example, the mean and the covariance matrix, and then we have the cluster assignments. But here's nothing. So the K, how many pi's do I have? I only have K numbers. How many thetas do I have? I only have K numbers. So I don't have for every data point additional information. When I introduce a latent variable, I'm now having a single variable for every data point. So this Z is not storing the mean or the covariance or all these parameters, but this is only storing for, the, for, the, for a certain data point to which cluster will it be assigned. So the Z is a, is a number from one to K. So you can also view it on the slide before here. So here, basically, I'm having additionally now to my data x1 to xn, I'm having these numbers 1 to k, which assigns each of these data points to one of the clusters. Additionally to these z, I have the parameter theta, which are now describing what the clusters are. So they are separate. Yeah. I mean, I could have done it like maybe you're suggesting, right? I could store for every data point its mean and its covariance matrix, but that would be wasteful. Let's have a table with only k rows where I store the mean, and I'm just pointing to these rows with the variable z. Okay, so the variable z is selecting one of the means. Okay. Um, now this is just another notation that is useful. So for this z, I could also, now if I have a, a z vector or a z which is equal to one to k, I always can write it also as a vector. So they are kind of one to one. And now the probability that the zi, so that the i's entry of such a variable z is equal to one, given my parameters, that is equal to pi i. And again, here I'm not super precise. So somehow the pi i, they are sometimes part of the theta. So usually they are also among the theta, right? So that's always a bit thing. A bit, I, I want to be unspecified here what exactly what distribution I'm using. And often the theta includes also the pi i, so don't be confused by that one. That's why I'm now saying, given that I have all parameters, where all parameters include the pi, now the probability that the i's coordinate of z is equal to one is exactly pi i, okay? Um, similarly now, given that I know that, the, that I'm kind of in class i, I could say that now my x distribution is now simplified. Before the distribution of x, conditioned on theta, I'm having the mixture distribution. But now if I know I'm in class I, yeah, I'm having this component. I really have a Gaussian distribution here. And then of course I can multiply them, right? This is just multiplying um, P of Z times P of X given Z, okay? And I get the joint distribution, which is then the pi I. And then I can also marginalize, so I can sum out the Z I yeah, just by summing out now all possibilities for that, I'm, I'm getting exactly the, the right mixture density that I was talking about. So basically here I've just introduced some notation in such a way that I'm getting that what I wanted to have. So I wanted to have this mixture model and this is like additional notation which will be useful on the following slides. Okay, so here's the Gaussian mixture model now where I'm basically replacing this component F by a Gaussian distribution. But in principle, you could have a mixture of Laplacian, a mixture of Dirichlet, a mixture of whatever you like. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. So this makes now the, the parameters more concrete. So if I have a Gaussian distribution, my parameters, they include all these weights, basically. And as we've seen on the previous slide, these weights are really probabilities. That's why we also use the letter pi. So they really sum up to one. And they are the probabilities of being in the different classes but they also act like normalized weights or like the weights of a convex combination. And um, then we have the parameters for each of the Gaussians. So we have all these means and we have all these covariance matrices. So in particular, if you think about it now, the pi's are scalar, right? The x are vectors of the same dimensionality as the x and the theta are matrices. Yeah, so if the x is a d-dimensional vector, the, theta, the sigmas here, they are like d by d matrices, yeah, covariance matrices. Good, and now I could also, again, rewrite, and I write it all out, also the obvious stuff maybe, again, introducing some notation. Now we introduce this notation tau i, and the tau i is now 
given that I have a particular data point, what is the probability of being in a certain class? Let's flip back a second. What did we calculate on the previous slide? So here I didn't condition on a particular data point, but I was saying, so given my parameters here, um, suppose now I'm, uh, I don't have a concrete data point, but I'm just having, um, uh, I'm just talking in general about my data set. Then for any Z, so the Z is really a random variable, yeah? In, in that case, uh, my probabilities are pi i. So the pi i are the prior probabilities of being assigned to some of the classes. Let's calculate the posterior probabilities. So given that I know I'm at a certain location and given my parameters, so what is the probability of being in a certain class? Okay, so let's just use the stuff that we define and let's write it out. So we just use base rule. And if you write out base rule, uh, you are getting um, this expression where basically at the top I'm having the joint distribution, which is the prior times the likelihood. And at the bottom I'm having basically the summation of all different possibilities. Where the different possibilities are now the different classes that the data point could be in, okay? So the joint distribution up here is telling me, given that I, uh, I so what is the probability that X is in a certain class, so with a comma, yeah? So X is at a certain location and Z is the first class and the joint distribution up here gives me that probabilities and I reweight it with all the other possibilities. So I'm just normalizing it. And that is really an instance of base rule. And now plugging everything in that we talked about, I'm having here the pi i times the Gaussian distribution and here down, here I have basically the summation over all possibilities. And this is now a way that allows us to classify a data point, right? As I said at the beginning, in unsupervised learning, we are missing the class label. So in unsupervised learning, we are inventing the class labels ourselves. And in a way, it is implemented by having fitted all these parameters here, pi i, mu i, sigma i, then by this, we are having invented labels and the label that you assign to a certain class will be the one basically to which mean do you fit the best, okay? And of course, it also depends on your covariance matrix. Um, let me just show you. Um, there's, there sometimes can be something weird happening. So <clears throat> suppose again, we are in 1D and you have one bump like this, or let's just directly draw the mixture, okay? So the mixture might look like this, okay? And now, so this is i equals one, and this is i equals two, and I have a mean over here, and I have a mean over there, and I have covariance matrices or covariances and so on. And now if I have a data point over here, I could ask, so what is the probability that it's in I2 and what is the probability that it's in I1, okay? And probably this will be the boundary where you would say, okay, all of these are in that class, all of those are in the other class, okay? Curiously, when you are in 1D, uh, you could have already some funny, as funny effects. Suppose you have a very wide Gaussian distribution with a certain weight, and then you have a very narrow one with a certain weight. Then what could happen is that when you sum them up, okay, you get a distribution that looks like this. And then it could be that only for this interval, you would say i is equal to two, and back here you would say i is equal to one, and here is also i is equal to one. So if you have different variances in your Gaussians, okay, then this can happen that in a way it's linearly separable, but you need several, several splits, okay? Or in two dimensions, if you have a Gaussian distribution of one class, which is like very large and you have a smaller one over here, it could be that only in this area here you would classify one class and in all the other area you are classifying the other one. So even we are talking about Gaussian distributions, right? We're getting already quite complicated separating lines here, okay, splits. So if your covariances are all the identity matrix, then everything is simple and you can show that it's just linear lines and straight lines. However, as soon as you align more complicated covariance matrices, like the classes also get quite complicated, okay? But this is just now for, 
for intuition of to be careful that the thing can get complicated quite quite fast. Okay, the other fun thing is here that this tau i, I mean, we are using Bayes' rule and we are calculating something like a posterior, right? And actually this is a posterior distribution. So the tau i can be seen like a posterior probability distribution, given that I know the location, and the pi i can be seen as the prior probability distribution. Okay, good, so far so good. Um, let's try inference in our Gaussian mixture model. And suppose now we are given some IID data, x1 to xn. Okay, so let's say this is what we are given and we want to estimate all our parameters. Um, maximum likelihood will um, maximize the log likelihood function with respect to our parameters. So we take this L, yeah, so this should be an L of theta given the data, where this notation now stresses the fact that the likelihood is a function of the parameters and the data is fixed or written as a probability, it's log P of the data given the probability. Okay, don't be confused by this, but this is common notation if you want to stress that you are talking about the parameters. So the, this L function is not normalized with respect to its first input, okay? Only the probabilities are normalized, but here the data is given and fixed. Okay, if we plug everything in, we have a whole data set, so we get a product of many data points, okay? So since we are multiplying the probability of the first with the second, the third data point. And for each data point now, we're having a mixture model. So we plugged in the mixture density for the data point Xn, okay? So we have a product and then a summation. Now the logarithm was designed in such a way so that it's kind of nicely separating everything and products become summations and everything is great. However, here the problem is you can move it beyond the summation sign and uh, beyond the product sign and make it a summation sign, but then you hit a summation sign and there's no easy rule for doing this, okay? So here now is the problem. We cannot really exchange the logarithm and the summation sign here. And that means we can't use the logarithm kind of to split this expression into simpler stuff, right? If you could apply a logarithm to the pi times something, you immediately would single out the pi. And then taking derivatives of log pi will be super simple because all the rest is constant. However, here everything is coupled with everyone else. So it's not so easy to do. So the whole maximization here becomes a, a nonlinear problem and actually there is no closed form solution. So you can, in principle, you can try to calculate all the derivatives here and you can try to set it to zero, but you will end up with a system of nonlinear equations to solve, okay, which is quite tough. You can do it like iteratively, of course, right? You can implement this and then do automatic differentiation, but it's a nonlinear optimization problem and there are no guarantees whatsoever. And now the procedure that I will show you in the following also has no guarantees. It's just one particular way to solve this, okay? It's not the answer to a super complicated question that solves everything. It gives us an analytic answer, but it is one possibility. And this method is called the EM algorithm for the Gaussian mixture models. And so this approach is now not fitting this model, but adding the latent variables into the model so now the latent variables will be more unknowns, okay? So here the only unknowns are the theta, okay? Where the theta are the parameter of my mixture model. And then the idea of the expectation maximization algorithm will be to add these latent variables, which are even more unknowns, and then alternatively updating one or the other, okay? So that is the basic idea. However, to understand this EM procedure, let's first discuss the K-means algorithm, which you might know already, okay? And if you don't know it, you will know it in a couple of slides. So what is the K-means algorithm? So the short answer is the K-means algorithm is now a special case of all that we are talking about today. So that's a simple special case. So basically you are given some data set and you want to cluster it in K clusters. That's where the K comes from and those K clusters are characterized by their means, okay? Now you wonder, what, what about the covariance matrices? The assumption is the covariance matrices are all the same. So the K-means algorithm understood probabilistically means that you are fitting a Gaussian mixture model where all covariance matrices are the identity matrix and you only care for the means, okay? So that is the K-means algorithm. Here comes the algorithm. And typically it falls from the sky and it doesn't follow from a probabilistic derivation. However, as we will see today, 
This is a special case of probabilistic inference with the right assumptions. Okay, so how does the k-means algorithm work? So you start with random means. Okay, you just start with some random assignment, and then you do the following two steps. First of all, you assign each data point to its closest mean. Okay, so you need to calculate the distance from a data point to all the different means, and then you pick the index which is closest. Okay, and the outcome here we call z, okay? And the z is of course different for every data point. That's why we have a sub n. And we use this notation of the zi. That's now the reason why we put the i to the exponent because we need the um, bottom subscript. Yeah, we need it for the which data point we are talking about. So basically now we are using this notation that the i's coordinate of the zn vector is one if that's the closest one and it's zero otherwise, okay? And as you can see now, this first step is inventing a latent variable given the current parameters, where the current parameters are the current means. So given that I have a couple of means, I can assign all data points to these things, or with other words, I can estimate the value of a latent variable. Um, and after that, after this assignment, I can update my means. And how do I update them? I update them in such a way that only the points that are assigned to the cluster can vote where the new mean should go. Okay, so you're taking an average over all data points, but you weight them yeah, with these cluster assignment variables. So the zni is only one for an xn that has been assigned to the i's mean. Okay, so you're only summing up those data points which are assigned to the cluster. Now divided by the summation of the zi, that is basically now ensuring that I'm really calculating a mean because the zi, you can sum them up and this is counting how many data points have been assigned to cluster i, for example, okay? So the summation is always going over n and the i is coming from the left-hand side here, okay? So I'm talking about the first mean. So I'm summing up all the first components of my latent variable here to count how many examples I have and this thing is selecting all the data points that I should take. So this is the k-means algorithm. And now one can show that this thing is converging. Okay, it is a nonlinear complicated procedure, which is not, um, not super obvious. Somehow it falls from the sky. But one can show if you perform these two steps, then the so-called distortion measure, which is defined down here, will decrease. Okay, so it will make this number here less than or equal to the previous one. And this is an exercise that you need to show. Right? On the next exercise sheet, you will prove that, that this is the case, that the distortion measure is really going down. Okay, how does this prove convergence? So let's look at the distortion measure. The distortion measure is a summation over stuff that is weighted by numbers which are either 0 or 1. And here we have a squared norm. So these numbers are all positive. Okay, so this thing is bounded below from zero. So it cannot be smaller than zero, okay? And if we can show that all the steps can only make this number smaller, yeah, then this is a proof of conversion because all bounded sequences are um, also converging. There's something like that. Or, or monotonically decreasing sequences that are bounded, they are, I think, converging. I think that's Weierstrass theory or something, I forgot. Okay, that's something from math. Anyway, now, so what you need to show to prove that k-means is converging, you need to prove that step one can only make this smaller and that step two can only make this smaller, okay? And let me tell you in words what you have to do. So suppose you are not changing anything up here, okay? Then in the next step, it's less than, it's equal to the previous one. Now suppose you did some change. That basically means that for one of the data points, yeah, you are choosing a new cluster that you assign it to. Okay, how did you choose it? You choose the new cluster because it's closer to your data point. So it's closer in the norm to the data point than the previous one. So that means that one of the terms here must have gotten smaller, okay? So it's the first step makes this expression smaller. What about the second one? So the second one of recomputing the mean, if you calculate the derivative of this j with respect to the means, you will get exactly this formula. So this is the expression that will exactly minimize this perfectly, okay? So for that reason, the second step is also 
making the distortion measure smaller. Okay, and it's greater or equal than zero. It's always getting smaller in each step or smaller or stays the same. Okay, if it's converged, it stays the same. So the whole thing converges. Great, so that is k-means. Here's a nice visualization from the Bishop book. So suppose this is your data set and those are the initial data points, the initial means that you get. So first of all, you do the cluster assignments. So here's now a straight line and basically that's the line, the boundary, all the points on the left will be assigned to the blue cross, all the points on the right are assigned to the red cross, okay? And once you have did, did this, you are recomputing the means. And as you can see, so the red points here, there's like a slightly more up here. And for the blue points, they are slightly more down here. So somehow if you recompute the means, the red mean will move over, over there and the blue mean will move somewhat to the left. And then again, you do a cluster assignment. And as you can see, what is a straight line? It's basically if you connect the two means, and you draw the Mittelsenkrechte. I forgot what it's in English, but you, you draw the straight line, which is orthogonal to the connection. You draw it right in the middle, okay? That one, that is really separating the world here into two spaces. And now really most of the red points will be assigned to the red cross and so on. And you do this for a couple of steps and after a while the whole thing converge and nothing will change anymore, okay? So that is k-means. I also made an implementation for you that you can play around with. So your task will be to implement um, these two functions. So the way I implemented it was um, I have a k-means step function, which takes my data and my current means, and it will output the assignments and the updated means, okay? So basically now the k-means step function is performing a single step of the update. So it will again, um, calculate all the distances from X to all the means and then select basically the index of the right mean and that will be your Z. And then you need to recompute the means and that's what you're passing back. And then there's a second function which I called k-means without step and that doesn't get the mu zero but it needs to initialize them itself and um, it, it takes a parameter k and does the for loop basically. So it does a for loop where it iterates until max eater, okay? However, possibly it, there's some norm condition fulfilled and you stop earlier. So if there's no change, yeah, if the mu's and the mu zero, they are not different from each other, like in a Frobenius norm type of sense, then 10 to the minus five, okay? Then you just break the loop, okay? And that's the k-means procedure here. And now there are different ways to try it. So you can try it just by generating some data. So here's also some, some more code up here, which you can play around with. So from kind of from first principles, I wrote you some code to get like a random integer. And I wrote you some code here to get like a random integer array and blah, blah, blah. And to generate a random dice, just look through it. I mean, the painful thing is only to get the NumPy stuff correct, but the whole thing is kind of trivial, okay? And I have a function for calculating a random mean or a random covariance matrix, okay? That's a bit more tricky here. So when you want to have a random covariance matrix, you generate a random squared matrix and you multiply it with itself, okay? Then you have a covariance matrix. I don't know what the distribution is if you do it like that, but that's at least one that ensures that you get a positive semi-definite matrix out of it. And then you can also iterate it. If you want to have several, you can use these functions. And then there's this sample, a Gaussian mixture model ones where you have the pi's and the means and the sigmas, and you can sample from them and then you can also plot them. So those are now samples from a Gaussian mixture model, okay, that you can play around with. And you can use these to test your method and your implementation. Okay, here's another one where I'm, um, not taking arbitrary covariance matrices, but here I said, I want to have always the identity matrix for the different sigmas, okay? And then the clusters, they all look like nice and the same, okay? Just more pretty. Okay, and then comes the k-means algorithm. Again, here's an implementation for you to calculate the distances. Um, this is an implementation you need to do yourself. And then in order to try it, you need to generate data. So here's my data and, um, uh, some plotting stuff. Okay, here's the data. I initialize it 
and then I can iterate it. But yeah, so this is kind of working. So let's see whether it's really working. So it's ah, so it doesn't look so good. So I have a, a fancier version, which is more like a like an um, I wrote a GUI for this. So this is now like a random data set and I can now step through this by walking through it. And as always, it worked when I first tried and now, oh, now it's working. So now it has one, two, three means here and it converge. I can reset the means. It will start over and show you the assignment. And then I can step through this and you can see how it kind of develops for a different data set, right? So here again, I'm starting with these three means. So I hit the reset mean. And now if I, the assignments are the colors basically that you've seen here. So finally this blue point here gets assigned to the cross up here because it's like somehow exactly on the line. Yeah. So you might wonder, so what is the separating boundary if you have several Gaussians where all means are the identity matrix and they have a nice property. Uh, let me just draw it like this. If this is mean one, mean two and mean three, then drawing the Voronoi diagram here. So that will be the answer if um, the identity matrix is a covariance matrix for everyone. Then basically I will have a straight line between those two, like splitting the connection. I will have a straight line over here and I will have a straight line over there. Okay. It's like having, if I have yet another one, then I will, it will look like that. So it's really a Voronoi tessellation For this case, okay, so for the case that all covariance matrices are like iso isotropic, so same in all directions, and they are all the same, then I get this Voronoi tessellation, okay? And that's basically what the k-means here is now doing. So if you have in, in this setup here, the Voronoi tessellation happens to have the blue point assigned up here. Okay, let's do a step. Okay, I did one step. And now the blue mean shifted a bit up here, so it lost this point over there, okay? And then there's the yellow one, and the yellow one um, got something from the blue one, right? So they are splitting this cluster. You might wonder, so why doesn't it catch that one down here? Because this mean is explaining this data better, okay? That's why it's there. Let's step again, okay? So this kind of got corrected here, and then we are done. Of course, now I could also run it with four. So let's take four data, uh, four means. So this is a, now uh, let's take a random assignment, which really looks random. Okay, how about that assignment? So one mean is over here, the other one there, one is up here and one down there. So what will happen is that these nearby blue points here, they will be assigned to this orange one. Okay, so this mean will move closer to the center this thing will lose some of the blue points. So also that one will move a bit to the left. Um, here's a yellow point. Yeah, this yellow one will eat up some of the purple ones up here. So the yellow one will move down and this purple one will get, yeah, will lose some of the points. However, it has these other cluster down here. So it was, will move to the other cluster. So let's see whether that's true. So that is the next step. So those two, they shifted a bit down and now it might happen again that there are purple points which were assigned to purple last round but after the update they will be assigned next time to the yellow one. So the top one here will eat up all the cluster in a second and here they are already almost done. So there are a couple of blue points which in the next round will be assigned to the orange one. Okay and now you see the, this one is slowly moving down here because nobody is competing for these points here. So this thing will, will be assigned to the other one down here. And now it basically did, okay, there's still a point missing somewhere from the last round, but now the whole thing converged. And now actually it doesn't change at all anymore, right? That's why the tolerance might not be like a big deal. So the tolerance is here, it's really zero, right? So there's no change at all after doing this. And um, as I said, if you have too many, um, uh, maybe eight is a bit too many, let's say six, so what's happening then, then I can also step these things through. Okay, in this case now one catched all, so let, let's reset them. So those are six. Oh, maybe I have a bug here in this in my stupid implementation. Ah, oh, that's weird. Okay, so 
doesn't work with with six for whatever reasons it doesn't work at all anymore okay fine okay looks like it's okay now it's still working so why isn't it not working with five ah reset okay yeah, it looks like with five data points, it doesn't work. I have no idea why. So it looks like I still have a bug in there, but I think you got the principle of this. Okay, there's a question. Uh, there is a question in the chat from Juan. Ah, okay, thank you for pointing out. Is the algorithm sensitive to our initial guess? Yes, definitely it is. Definitely it is very sensitive to the initial guess, okay? Let me show you some, some failure cases on the board, right? Which are really going bad. So. Suppose your true data looks like this. Right? Looks like, oh, perfect. This must be a nice example for k-means, okay? But now let's say zero is over here, okay? And you are sampling your initial means from a Gaussian that is over there, okay? So let's sample two, two means. So this is mu1 and this is mu2, right? Could happen. And now the first assignment will assign everyone to mu2 uh, to mu1 and mu2 will be empty. And my implementation is super simple, so I don't catch this case. But once a mean is empty, you cannot update it anymore. You will divide by zero, okay? And basically you can omit it if it's if it's empty. So in this case, depending on this initial assignment, it can happen that both get into the same cluster. However, possibly I'm, I'm a little bit more lucky and my mu2 is down here, okay? And in that case, it happens that this cluster will be assigned to mu2, this one to mu1, and everything works. That's why when you see implementations of k-means, often they ask you how many random restarts do you want? Do you want 1,000 random restarts? Okay, and then you run the whole method a thousand times with different random restarts, and then you look for which sets were assigned most often across these different 1,000 1, starts, okay? And then this will be the clustering result. Of course, here's another problem that your data might be somewhere, okay? And your means are um, very far away. For that reason, there are different ways to initialize the mean. So one is that you say, okay, I sampled from a Gaussian distribution and I don't care for it where the data is. The other idea is to say, okay, my mu1, it's x1, and my mu2 is x2. So you just take two data points, okay? And then you are sure that you are inside your data. However, if you do it like that, and the data was sorted, it might happen that this is mu1 or mu2, and this thing is mu1. So possibly you get assignments from the same cluster. So even better would be that you kind of random randomly select one and randomly select another one, okay? So you randomly select an index and randomly select another index and those should be your cluster assignments. Practically how you implement it, you take a random permutation of the numbers from one to n and then you take two numbers, the first two numbers from this random permutation. Then you get like two points and you can calculate the probability with what probabilities will you be in two clusters and with what probability will you be in the same cluster? And even if you're in the same cluster, everything should work out fine in this case. So here's no problem. Of course, if you're now looking for 10 means in this picture, um, then some of them will run empty. However, something else that could happen is, suppose your true data set is just, just a single cluster, okay? And what happens if you run k-means on it? Then what will happen is that there will be one mean on one side and one mean on the other side. And basically the cluster is chopped into half, okay? It's like, you know this, when you go to the butcher, right? And there's this picture of the pig, of the different parts of the pig. So there's only one pig, but it's clustered into different parts, but they're all touching each other, right? That's exactly the image that you get when you run k-means on a single cluster, okay? So what you need to do after doing this, you should look at the distance matrix. So you should check whether there's like some split between the points or not, okay? So if, for example, you could ask, so what is the minimum distance so 
pick an arbitrary point here and an arbitrary point here and minimize the distance between the cluster and see whether you are very close to each other. Okay? I have a question. Yeah, of course. Ah, okay. Um, the thing is, let's see, that's a good question. Okay. So you're asking, so why couldn't it be that all the means are at the same location, right? Um, at the beginning, it could happen by chance, right? Yes, if, it, right, exactly. So suppose you have a weird bug and you initialize the mu1 to be x17. And somehow your implementation, unfortunately, also assigns the M2 to X17. Okay, so they really have exactly the same starting points. That's of course something that you don't want. So you really want different points. And when they are different, they will stay different. So why are they staying different? Because, um, so here you are picking an index and it could happen that you might have the same distance to one of them, but the argmin here is now meant, if there are two means that have exactly the same distance to your data point, pick one randomly, okay? So that helps, but it's an important question. It's one of the hard to catch bugs that can happen. The other thing is if there are two means which are exactly the same, um, with picking randomly here one of them will resolve it ideally, right? Because you're kind of randomly assigning and then there will be a little shift between the, the data points that are assigned and then they will diverge the two means, okay? So that, that should be fine. But you're right, there are these corner cases. One thing is a mean could be empty, that's one possibility. Two means could be identical, which you actually never want. And maybe it's it has probability zero, but depending on your code, it could have probability one because that's how you initialize them, right? And um, in that case, then you have to make sure that these assignments are random, okay? Okay, okay, so far so good. So that is the k-means algorithm. Now, of course, um, okay, we, we know this, we know estimation very well, right? This is this latent variable that we introduced, the assignments, and here we are updating the means. So how about having a k-means slash covariance algorithm, okay? So a k-covariance algorithm, okay, Gaussian algorithm. How would you implement it? Okay, recompute the means and recompute the covariance matrices. Okay, so that's something that one could immediately do. And then you have a Gaussian mixture model fit. Okay, and that's what we will look at next. So um, the Zn are random assignment variables and those are the latent variables. Um, so if we know these Zn for each data point Xn, these latent variables, then the update gets very similar. And um, however, typically we don't know the ZNs and now what in the following comes a different way to write the same stuff again, right? So another point of view is that we don't know the value ZN and that we can integrate it out. And instead, we, instead of having a concrete value ZN, we have a distribution over it, okay? So we have a probability, where's my mouse? Okay, whoops, there it is. So we have a probability here for um, that the Zn has a particular value given that I'm at a particular location. Of course, here the Xn is co uh, compared <clears throat> to the mean and the covariance matrix, right? And then if it's close by, then the Z Zn sub i will be equal to one. So I have a certain probability distribution, but I don't have a concrete value, but I can calculate the expectation, the conditional expectation in this case of the Zn. And actually as it turns out, since, um, these are like a binary variable. I can one times this probability plus zero times the other probability. And it will turn out that this probability is exactly this expectation. So this probability is exactly the value, okay? And it gets the name tau i sub n. And that is exactly the previous one that we defined before. So this is another way to talk about, so what is the, um, the posterior assignment, yeah? The posterior assignment is the same as the expectation over this latent variable. So it's all the same stuff. And now the intuitive thing is that instead of uh, using these hard assignments, these Zn being assigned to a one or zero, 
I could also plug in these probabilities in here for the estimation. Uh, and by this, I'm having like a softer update. So I'm taking into account all data points for every mean, but I weight them with the probability that is assigned to a particular mean. Okay, that's also possible. So in K means we have these hard assignments. So you are in one of the classes, but not in everyone else's. And then there's so-called soft assignments, which are like um, every, assigning every point to every mean, but depending with the different probabilities. Okay, and they are called hard and soft because the zi are coming from a discrete set and the tau i are coming from a continuous set, okay, from the interval zero to one. Good, so let's do this. So um, instead of doing these hard assignments now, we are, have written down the, this expectation maximization procedure for the Gaussian mixture model, where we now calculate these soft assignments, which are the posterior distributions. And then in the M step, we are recalculating not only the means, but also the covariances. And we can also recalculate the cluster assignments, of course, uh, the prior probabilities. So somehow um, the, let's see, so the, if I have a particular data point and I look at all the tau i n and I'm summing up i equals one to k, what I get is one, of course, right? However, I could also sum up the other variable. So I could also sum up over the bottom index. And this is kind of counting how many are assigned to my cluster i, okay? Think of this as one and zero, then this is really counting the elements of a hard assignment, but they can also sum up the probabilities. And that is like the expected number of points that you will get for your cluster, okay? And those are basically now by one divided by n will give me now new probabilities of the different clusters. So by these formulas now, the means could move around, the shape of the covariance can change, and the heights of the different bumps can also change. Okay, it's now a generalization of the k-means procedure. Okay, um, this is again a cartoon from the Bishop book. I don't have an implementation yet, but this plot is really nice. Um, so the data initially has no cluster assignments. That's why it has a different color. So there's a the blue cluster and the red cluster. And initially they are like circular Gaussians of the same covariance matrix. That's why the circles are the same. So they both have the identity matrix as their covariance matrix. And now we get the first cluster assignments, but we get a soft assignment. And that's why the color is changing from red to blue continuously. Okay. So that's why it's looking like, like this purple thing in the middle. So they are like equally likely in one or the other cluster, okay? And now if I take these weights and recalculate the means and the covariances, now I'm getting this ellipsoidal thing here, where basically now this long elongated shape is um, due to the fact that the blue ones are spread out very elongated here. And the red ones are also spread out a little bit less. Okay, so we get a little bit less ellipse over here. Okay, and then after having now these new parameters for the mean and the covariance and for the size, yeah, the size is basically explaining, is encoding the pi. Okay, the size of the ellipse is the probability of being in that cluster. And then again, I could do a reassignment and a reassignment and a reassignment, and then at the end, I'm ending up with a mixture of Gaussian where each of them has a different shape and in this case also a different height. Good, great. Um, so far so good, right? So that's like my, my favorite phrase. So um, by this procedure now that we kind of intuitively derived. So how did we derive it? We, we started with k-means and then we said, okay, let's take soft assignments here and let's estimate all these parameters, okay? Of course, now the question is, we know what the likelihood is. So the question is, does it really maximize the likelihood? Can we say something about it? Or is it just like a nice heuristic that is doing something useful, okay? And for this now, we can calculate derivatives and play around here with some numbers. So, but it's not super easy. So if you take the derivative of this expression now with respect to the mean, for example, you are getting this expression setting it to zero, we get um, the formula that we know and that we used, okay? So 
somehow it looks like if I take the derivative of this log likelihood here and I maximize with respect to the, um, the mean, I'm getting exactly the update that I wanted. So what about these three points that are missing? They're a little bit tricky and that's why I wrote out the derivation for you. And here's an explanation of all the different steps. And let me point out a couple of steps which are a bit tricky in here, even if you know the explanation. So let's just go through it. So first of all, of course, summation and the partial derivative I can exchange. By the way, possibly you can do the same with matrix differential calculus, but in this case, I wanted to use these partials, okay? Um, so we can exchange the summation and it, great. And now comes the first magic step that might be a bit hard to understand. So how do you get from here to here, okay? So for this, we are using this formula, the partial derivative of a function logarithm of g of a yeah, can be shown to be exactly that one, that it's one divided by g of a times the derivative of g of a. And this is just the, um, this uh, Kettenregel. So what is it in English? Chain rule. So this is just a chain rule, okay? So the other function is logarithm and its derivatives is one divided by x, kind of, right? And then times the derivative of the inner function. So this is just using the chain rule. So applying the chain rule over here gets rid of the logarithm and I get a one divided by all the summation. Wow, this gets really complicated. Um, where do we want to get? So surprisingly, following a couple of more tricks here, we get an expression in front of the summation that is exactly our tau i, okay? So that's where we want to get. We want to kind of do some more tricks here to get exactly the tau i, and then we get something nice and simple at the end, okay? So let's see how we proceed. So, okay, so that was the first step using this formula over here. Next step is that the summation over j, yeah, all summons will disappear where j is not equal to i, okay? So the partial derivative is just picking this one piece out of it where I have the i, and the rest of the summons, they disappear. Okay, great. Now comes another magic trick, and here again, I'm using like the derivative of um, the logarithm of g of a, but using the formula in a different form. So this is also the chain rule, but I move the g of a to the other side, okay? And now I'm having like the partial derivative of a function, and which is the setup that I have up here, and I can introduce back the logarithm if I multiply with the g of a. So here I'm using use the chain rule in one direction for a particular g of a, and here I'm using the chain rule backwards for another function g of a. So now my function g of a is just this pi i times fi, and this thing will be dragged out of it, and I, it appears up here, and I will get the derivative of the logarithm again. So this looks like a weird step, and you might wonder, so why on earth would you like to do this? That's kind of weird. Why do you want to reintroduce the logarithm here, right? That's kind of strange. And the reason is, we want to write, get this expression here because that one is exactly the tau i, okay? So that is the only reason to do this. Uh, okay, there's another reason. The f is a PDF, okay? So it's nice to have a logarithm right in front of a PDF, okay? That's super useful because then typically the derivative of the, of the Gaussian might be super complicated because you have the e function and one divided by covariance and blah, blah, blah. And if you have the logarithm of the Gaussian distribution, the derivative is much simpler, okay? So the pi disappears when you apply the logarithm on the, so here's the logarithm, or here's the pi i missing in a way, but the logarithm of pi i times f i is the same as the logarithm of pi i plus the logarithm of f, and then the pi i has no mu, so the logarithm of pi disappears because it's like a summit. Okay, and then I have the logarithm of the Gaussian distribution, and I can kind of almost read off the derivative of that one when I have the logarithm in front of it, okay? And then I get this nice formula. I just need to shuffle around a bit this stuff, um, get this summation, uh, the sigma thing gets out of it, and then I get exactly the derivatives that I presented to you on the previous slide, okay? By the way, those are not, those two tricks are not just two random tricks that uh, just happen to be here. This trick of using the chain rule with the log probability is a very common trick. There are whole papers on it, why log PDF is something super useful and that there are log derivative tricks for exactly this situation. And they are always based 
on these kind of steps that you're using the chain rule forward or backward. Okay, so that's like a very classic one. Okay, great. So now, if we set all derivatives of our log likelihood to zero, okay, then we get these updates here, right? Which is really nice. I mean, those are the updates. Those are exactly the same as we had in our previous thing where we just say, okay, here, let's use the estimator of the covariance matrix. Let's use an estimator for the pi. Let's use an estimator for the mu. So that those were exactly the choices. However, we are a little bit cheating here now. So what's the problem? Somehow we use the tau in such a way like it is constant, right? So the tau um, also contains our parameters. However, we ignored that. So let's flip back a second. So what did we do here? So we took the derivative with respect to mu of the log likelihood and we got this nicely shaped formal formula, okay, and then we said, setting this formula equal to zero, I can solve for the mu i, okay, and I get a nice expression. However, here we were cheating, the tau i n and this tau i n over here also depend on the mu i, right? Why? Where is it? So if you look at it, at the step where we replace this expression with the tau sub n, yeah, we kind of put under the carpet that the f sub i has this theta sub i in here. So there is a mu sub i in the tau i. So in principle, uh, we can do this derivation and we can resolve it from mu i, but it's still a bit heuristic. So again, still we are a bit cheating here, right? Because the tau i, they do depend on the mu i. Actually, the tau i down here also depends on the mu i, the, the correct one. So this is a bit cheating, this derivation. So it's a bit more heuristic, but only somewhat more heuristic, okay? So the same happens, of course, for the derivation of the sigma i formula. Also here, the tau i do depend on the sigma i, and also for the pi i. The tau i do depend on the pi i. So the derivation is a bit fishy here, but it is very intuitive, okay? And it is the right thing to do, as we will see when we have a more general point of view for the expectation maximization. Um, now we have different ways to derive these assignments. So the first one was we were starting with k-means and then we were replacing the hard assignments with soft assignments, okay? And then said, okay, here's an algorithm now for the Gaussian mixture model. That was the first super heuristic derivation. The second derivation where we set the derivatives of the log zero, uh, log likelihood to zero, it's a little bit less heuristic, but still there's some cheating. However, all these derivations are fine, and this is a, a valid algorithm for which you can prove convergence, so everything is okay, just the derivation is a bit fishy. Um, next time, I think next time, so we have 10 minutes left, and I think it's too, mat too much material for the last 10 minutes, next time we will try to write everything up more rigorous, by using the so-called expected complete log likelihood. And that is a way to write down the derivation in a better way, hopefully a more convincing, less heuristic way. Because the question is what we don't know here by doing this kind of little cheating, are we introducing an error or what kind of error are we introducing? Are we really minimizing the log likelihood with these updates or not? And as we will see next time, yes, these updates are a valid algorithm and they will really um, uh, maximize the log likelihood. So everything is fine. But the derivation that we did was um, a bit heuristic. Um, however, now why did I show you all of this? I mean, the thing is, that's typically how you learn about it, right? You first learn about the k-means clustering and the algorithm is so intuitive to use, right? So you just come up with it without thinking about probabilities. However, then when you think about probabilities, then you think, so why not do something more fancy and let's use this Gaussian mixture model update. So why not make it nicer? And then at some point you might think, so but now how, how valid is it what we are doing? So can I really put it onto, onto more solid grounds? And then there comes the next heuristic derivation, which is calculating derivatives, but using a little bit of cheating here, okay? And finally, hopefully next time, yeah, we will see a more rigorous derivation of the method yeah, that shows us that this is really all okay. Um, so, 
Okay, I think I leave that for the next lecture. So maybe I suggest that we stop here. I run over time so often. So let's maybe today let's stop early. Okay, so this is the end now. And next time we will look into the more theoretical stuff um, for another more rigorous way to derive the whole thing. And let me just stress, um, it's not wrong the first thing. It's also not wrong to come up with an algorithm which is intuitively nice, right? And to play around with it and plug new things in it and make it more complicated. That's totally fine. Um, however, it's even better if then 10 years later or even later, later, people can show you that you are doing something in a way that is optimal, okay? Or something that is kind of valid. So that's something useful to learn. The other point of the whole derivation here is we could start after k-means and say, okay, that's a clustering algorithm, but the derivations that we are doing here and also next time, they are very general and they are very related to variational inference, which is like a very uh, tough topic in machine learning. For example, they are also important for the variational autoencoder and we will see them for the particular case of the Gaussian mixture model. But often derivations are in, in one method, easy, and then they are applied in a more complicated setup. And so you should first learn the derivations and the motivations for certain things in the easier stuff. And that's what we will do next time. Anyway, there's also time for questions. So any more questions about the stuff until here? If not, I thank you a lot for your attention and I see you on Wednesday. Okay, bye.